All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first Basler Chair Lecture. I'm Blaine Schubert. I'm the director of the Center of Excellence in Paleontology. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Basler Chair before I introduce uh, before I introduced Mauricio himself. The Basler Chair of Excellence honors Wayne Basler, an individual who has continuously supported the university. The Basler Chair actually falls under the College of Arts and Sciences and helps to bridge the gap between the sciences, the arts, and humanities. Mauricio Anton, our Basler Chair, comes to us from Spain, and he will serve as the Basler Chair throughout this semester. He is co-hosted here by the Center of Excellence in Paleontology, Geosciences, and Art and Design. He's an internationally acclaimed paleoartist and paleontologist. His painstaking approach to anatomical accuracy, thorough field observations, and dynamic reconstructions are extraordinary, making him one of the most sought after paleoartists by researchers, museums, and publishers around the world. And over the course of this semester, Mauricio will give three presentations. He'll give an art exhibit, and he is co-teaching two classes on scientific illustration and paleo art here at ETSU. He's also serving as an artist in residence at the Natural History Museum. You can see him here over here on the right, actually on exhibit. So when you're out at the Natural History Museum, you can look in just like you can look in and see us when we're working in the collections or the prep lab. He is visible right there doing his uh, reconstructions. And then over on the left in one of his classes, uh, teaching about drawing cats in that picture there. Following tonight's presentation, Mauricio will also give another presentation on March 10th. Uh, this is another picture at the Gray Fossil Site. Here he's actually looking at the red panda fossils from Gray and reconstructing what they looked like. But following tonight, he will have another presentation up in uh, March 10th at 7 p.m. This one will be in Culp Auditorium. So we'll go away from this spot over to there. He'll be talking about reconstructing Neanderthals and other fossil hominids and, <coughs> excuse me, and dealing with scientific and social aspects of paleoanthropological art. Next, he and his students this semester will have a paleo art exhibit here in this building in Slocum Galleries. And that will be, uh, that will start with a reception on March 24th from 5 to 7 p.m. For his final presentation, we will return here to Ball Hall Auditorium on April 9th at 7 p.m. And Mauricio will give a talk titled, First Hand Study of Extant Animals as a Reference for Natural History Reconstructions from Dissection to Wildlife Observation. So if you'd like to learn even more about Mauricio, you can find him on the internet. You can also find a lot more just by going to the Basler Chair website. If you, if you simply search in each ETSU Basler Chair, his page will come up with a lot more information. This evening, Mauricio is speaking on a topic that he is particularly well known for, the extinct saber-toothed cats. Today is also Charles Darwin's birthday, and I wanted to take a minute and mention that. This is a day of international science recognition and celebration, and so we're lucky to have Mauricio here presenting on this particular day. And as we move forward and we watch and we listen and we learn about saber-toothed cats, I think it's sort of fun to think about what might Charles Darwin have thought about these saber-tooths. And now, without further delay, Mauricio. All right, thank you, Blaine, very much for this uh, presentation. Uh, of course, I'm very grateful to the East Tennessee State University for giving me this opportunity to share uh, my work with uh, all the students and with uh, audiences like uh, this uh, here. 
So thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And uh, yes, I'm going to talk about my favorite uh, creatures from the distant past, the saber tooths. And at the same time, I'm going to talk to you about my work attempting to reconstruct them. So I'm going to tell you about what it is to be a paleo artist. And uh, paleo artist is like a composite of paleo from old artists, artists. So that means I'm a very old artist. <laughs> I think not yet, not yet. Uh, it's a shortened version for paleontological artist. Uh, the, the, the word was coined by my colleague uh, Mark Hallett and it became popular. So uh, what we do, paleo artists do, is create images like this that you are seeing that try to be accurate and at the same time uh, attractive uh, renditions of uh, animals that nobody has seen alive. And the saber tooth, of course, are a good e example of this. So uh, for me, saber tooths and paleo art uh, are part of uh, childhood uh, fascination. Uh, when I was just uh, seven, eight years old, I came across these kind of uh, illustrations, like this illustration by uh, uh, Rudolf Salinger, the uh, American paleo artist, and I was instantly sucked in. It was like a time portal, and I was not only seeing uh, scientific information, I was seeing a window into a legendary world of uh, endless wilderness and uh, spectacular but uh, dangerous animals. So even at that young age, I had uh, a fascination but also questions in my young head. So uh, the first question was about this painting. And I was wondering, is this real? Is this the product of the imagination of people, uh, of the scientists and the artists who created it? Or is this how it was? If I could just travel back in time, is this what I would see? And that basic question uh, came together with others more concrete, like what did the saber-toothed cats look like? Uh, how did they move around? How did they walk? How did they run? And how did they hunt and kill their prey? And finally, why are they extinct? Why did they become extinct so that now we cannot see a living saber tooth? So the, the natural way for me to find the answers was to embrace the career of paleo art. That wasn't straightforward. It took me some. Uh, you know, it took some uh, coincidences, some uh, um, you know moments of good luck, to really be able to become a professional paleo artist. But uh, as I told you to begin with, we paleo artists create images, and you see at the right end of this uh, sort of mosaic, this final reconstruction. But that is only the end of a process. So I see my work as a process, and that's how I want you to understand it. So uh, if you look at the uh, left of this, of this picture, you see the fossil skull of the saber-toothed cat seen from different views. That's the source that I use in order to create uh, this uh, rendering of the, this more lifelike rendering of the animal. How do I achieve that? That is uh, much of the content of this uh, talk. But before we go into that, what is a saber tooth? Uh, in a way, saber tooth has become uh, the same in, in the popular mind as Smilodon. Smilodon was a, a huge, spectacular saber tooth cat. We see the skull of a Smilodon here on the left in different views, and we see a reconstruction of a family of a Smilodon here on the right. It was uh, much heavier than a lion or a tiger, and it lived in the Pleistocene. That is not very long ago in geological terms. And it is 
of course, the, uh, I think it still is the uh, official uh, fossil of the state of California. Uh, the popular uh, character of uh, Diego from the uh, Ice Age uh, animated movies is inspired in Smilodon, but there were many other species, many other even families of saber-tooth predators. So a saber-tooth is just one of many kinds of extinct predators that develop that kind of, of uh, adaptations that we are going to, to see in this presentation. But the main and most spectacular is, of course, its upper canines. These huge upper canine teeth show us that these animals evolved to kill their prey in a very specific way. So still on the subject of a Smilodon, I wanted to share this image with you. This is a painting that I did uh, quite a few years ago. It shows the upper Pleistocene, the Ice Age of South America. And this is uh, the area where uh, Charles Darwin uh, found many of the fossils that helped him to uh, build the theory of uh, evolution. Uh, with the beagle, he um, visited um, several areas in the coast of Argentina and found fossils of several of the animals that we see in this reconstruction, like this funny uh, mixture of a camel and a taper with, with its uh, you know, hanging uh, uh, trunk, the giant uh, uh, ground slots, and the saber tooths. But unfortunately, Nobody knew what a saber tooth was when Darwin uh, visited that area and uh, excavated uh, his fossils. So he missed that discovery by uh, a few years. Smilodon was officially uh, named as a fossil uh, genus uh, in 1841 or something like that. But it took several more years for a good fossil record of this animal to accumulate. So uh, the heyday of the study of saber tooths came actually after the death of Charles Darwin. But I'm sure that he would be especially fascinated by saber tooths, not only because of their adaptations, but because they are the prime example of convergent evolution, as we will see. So, Coming back to paleo art, paleo art uh, can seem like the, logic, the logical thing to do when you have fossils in front of you and you want to reconstruct them and to see what these animals look like. But for most of human history, it was simply impossible to conceive of something like paleo art, among other things, because, because even the concept of an extinct species didn't exist. So uh, when people found fossil bones of uh, extinct vertebrates, they thought they were the bones of dragons or, or giants or cyclops, uh, any kind of mythological creatures. So only with the development of modern paleontology was it possible for the, the discipline of paleo art to emerge. And probably the single most important person in the development of this discipline is Charles Knight. Charles Knight was an American artist who worked uh, in the early 19th, in the late 19th and early uh, 20th century. And he uh, developed not only his uh, artistic style, so evocative uh, in his recreations of extinct uh, animals, but a scientific method for their reconstruction. So what is this method? It's, uh, it's uh, something very laborious, but at the same time, it has the beauty of simplicity. So that allows me to summarize it for you in just three steps. What do we paleoartists do when uh, scientists bring us a collection of disparate bones. First of all, we uh, put them together to create an assembled skeleton. 
in the paper or in the 3D software of, the, of our computers, but for that, our guide is the shape of the joints. The surface of the joints between the bones is telling us what the range was of flexion and extension between the different segments that make up the skeleton of an animal. So in, by studying uh, those, uh, those joints, we can assemble a skeleton in a lifelike posture. That allows us to continue into the second um, stage of the reconstruction, which is to add muscles from the inside out. In order to know how those muscles were and where they fit, we are going to use as a guide the shape of uh, particular areas in the bones that have responded to the tensions of, of the muscles and, and the tendons during the life of the animal. So uh, those attachment areas, as we call them, are showing us where this or that muscle was attached in life. So we carefully, muscle by muscle, build our animal, and finally we arrive to the third uh, stage, which is reconstructing the external appearance skin, fur, color patterns. And there is like a big jump between stage two and stage three. Because up to stage two, uh, we are essentially grounding our reconstruction on the preserved anatomy, on the preserved osteology of the fossil animals. But when we uh, try to reconstruct the external appearance, there are many aspects about which we don't have any direct information. So we need to make inferences. So this is a more speculative uh, part of the reconstruction process. So here is a more detailed uh, example so you can have an, a visual idea of what it is like to go from the deepest uh, muscles, as you see on the, on the drawing, on, on drawing on top right, to the intermediate layer, as you see uh, bottom left, to the most uh, superficial layer of muscles. So this takes many hours of work, but only that attention to detail is going to guarantee that we are not accumulating mistakes one on top of another. And then we get to this final stage. And here I'm giving you this example uh, we are seeing uh, Smilodon all the time, our uh, favorite saber tooth. But uh, was it spot, as we see on top? Was it plain, as we see in the, in the drawing at bottom? Well, both are possible. So uh, we need to, to, uh, to use some reasoning to, to back up our decision. So we know that uh, modern big cats that live in the open plains, like the lions, had plain color coats. But that's almost an exception because most uh, living cat species have spots. And that is no coincidence. On one hand, it is very likely that that spot pattern is the primitive ancestral uh, and most uh, widespread condition for the whole cat family to which Sabertooths belonged. But also, if these cats haven't changed their spots, so to speak, it is because they are useful. Those spots break their, their outline and uh, help to conceal their presence in the dapple light and shade of forests and help them to uh, to hunt their prey more easily. So uh, if, if our fossil site evidence indicates that our saber-toothed cat lived in forests, then probably would be safe to infer a spot uh, pattern as we see on, on the top uh, picture. And then we would uh, arrange those spots following the, the basic geometry of cat spotting which is not random. It follows a pattern, and that is a pattern that the cats share with their closest living relatives, like hyenas 
or uh, genets, animals that uh, belong in different families, but whose spots are arranged with similar patterns. So once we have a, a, a reasonable uh, approximation to the external appearance of our saber-toothed cat, we need to set it in motion. And uh, that is what we call reconstruction of locomotion. And for that, I find especially important to observe their living relatives, the big cats. For instance, if you want to know how Smilodon would uh, run in order to chase its prey, um, you first have to know how modern big cats do it. And that you can hardly see in a zoo. You need to see the saber-toothed cat in the open plains. Sorry, <laughs> I would love to see the saber-toothed cat in the open plains. <laughs> to see the modern cats in their habitats uh, behaving naturally. So uh, I felt so fortunate um, several years ago when this uh, strong male lion began to gallop in front of me, like offering me a lesson in, in uh, big cat locomotion. So with my camera, I, I made choo -choo 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 a whole series of photographs, which I later proceeded to analyze back at home. So I traced uh, the outline of the animal on top of these photographs. And using uh, previous uh, uh, anatomical knowledge, I tried to place the muscles and the bones inside that outline. So that uh, there are several um, like key points in the external, you know, in the body of, uh, of an animal that indicate us where the bones are hiding inside. And that allowed me to create images like this one. So I uh, kept working with more uh, pictures of that particular um, race. And I was impressed because this animal was really speeding in front of me. The whole thing took like uh, four or five seconds. But I took many pictures. And still, the animal looked heavy. It looked like it was, you know, investing an effort, uh, uh, using muscle force to propel itself uh, across the savanna. Why? So uh, looking again at, at the whole sequence, I noticed that there wasn't a, sin a single moment when all four feet were on the air. So at any point, there was one, two, or like here, even three feet touching the ground. So the lion was galloping, but it was doing it in a very stable manner like it uh, didn't want to stumble or anything, because it is aware that it is very heavy. The other element that gave this impression of weight was that the vertebral column was giving under the weight of the viscera and the rib cage of the animal. So, so you see that it is like a bridge, like a suspended bridge between the uh, anterior and posterior limbs. So I, I thought this is a good image to uh, try to use as a reference to reconstruct my saber tooth. And that is what I did. So I drew the skeleton bone by bone, arranging it in the same angles of limbs and, and, and uh, spine and, and head and neck as a lion, but the result is very different because the proportions are very different. So you will notice that compared to the lion, the lion has very long hind limbs and relatively short forelimbs, but Smilodon had huge forelimbs. It had an incredibly big shoulder blade. So in a way, it's looking more like a hyena because it's very front heavy. So. I am transferring the, the action of one cat to another, but because I am being true to the proportions of the skeleton, I am obtaining a completely different image. But still, because I have followed that gate, that, that uh, 
you know, that sequence of, of steps, some of the, of the heaviness of that galloping lion has survived to this, to this translation. So that's some of the main exercises that I need to do uh, in order to reconstruct the saber tooths. But now I want to, to, to show you some of the diversity of saber tooths uh, by also showing you my reconstructions of um, a few of them. So first, let us get to know the close relatives of a Smilodon. Smilodon was not only a saber tooth, it was a saber tooth cat. That means it belongs within the cat family and it's more uh, specifically, more technically called a Machyrodontine. So uh, Machyrodontines were a subfamily within the cat family. Our house cats are felines. And uh, so that's another subfamily. And the uh, lion is a pantherine. So that's yet another one. So if you look at the, at the uh, phylogeny in the left, you can see the cat family in red, and you can see how it's nested among a whole array of living and extinct families of carnivorans. So the, you can divide this into big branches. The branch on top, which includes uh, six families, is the Feliformia. That's the cat half of the carnivore uh, order of the carnivorans. And in the, in the bottom branch, you see quite a few families, some uh, extant, some extinct. And uh, so you can see how the, the cats are nested within this uh, array. And of course, the saber tooth cats are only one part of the cat family, that one I showed in red, Philidae, the Philids. But there were other saber tooth cats. No, sorry. Other saber tooths. I'm, I'm confusing you and it is complicated enough. Other saber tooths which belong in a completely different family, Barbophilids. If you see the arrangement in that uh, phylogeny, you see they are very close to the Felidae. That's what, uh, what biologists call a sister group. They are so close that they are like sisters. And that's the way we have been seeing it for the last uh, few decades. But uh, last month, a paper was published which described an incredibly perfect fossil skull of, of a barbourophilid, and uh, it contains new information. So now it seems that the barbourophilids were actually much closer to the new rabbits that we see on top of the, of the diagram. So what are mean rabbits? Yet another family of saber tooths. This was more distant from the cat. You see it in its own little branch on top. They uh, evolved and existed long before any cat uh, walked the earth. So uh, the, the extinction of the new rabbits uh, happened uh, during the early uh, stages of cat, of true cat evolution. There were more saber tooths, which didn't even belong to the order carnivora. So on top, you see a, a creodon saber tooth. So please check the bottom part of the, of the phylogeny. And you see from the bottom, from the, bottom the carnivora and the creodonta. So the creodonta are again something of a sister group to the carnivora. Okay, another family. They exist even before, of course, before the cats, even before the in rabbits. So here's this pretty animal with saber tooth adaptations. And then the bottom uh, illustration shows a marsupial saber tooth. So this animal was more closely related to a kangaroo than it was to a cat. But still, it developed these kind of saber tooth adaptations. So all that array of uh, non-related groups developing, like, like playing with the same uh, design, 
is showing us that do, this was a good design. This was a good solution to the uh, challenges of being a predator uh, trying to hunt big prey, big relative to your own size, because the animal you see on top, the, the um, uh, creodont uh, saber tooth, was no taller than a house cat. So that wouldn't be uh, killing mastodons or anything of the sort, but it killed animals larger than itself. But we aren't done yet. <laughs> there were non-mammalian saber tooths So these creatures lived before any mammal, and that's not enough to say. They lived before the dinosaurs. They lived at a time when the Earth was a, a, a really alien place, and uh, they were wiped off from the surface of the Earth by an extinction that was much more uh, extreme than the one that killed off the dinosaurs. So these creatures called the Gorgonopsians, you see them in, in the phylogeny, in the, in the bottom section. So you see the mammals at the very bottom, and a couple of steps removed, there were the Gorgonopsians. So uh, these creatures also found that it was very useful to have saber-like uh, upper canine teeth in order to dispatch their, their prey. But back to, uh, to a more uh, cozy and, and warm and fussy uh, past, uh, the time of the mammals and our friend uh, Smilodon. Uh, well, I don't know if uh, he would be our friend if uh, he was alive in this, in this uh, hole. But, uh, like all predators, like all apex predators, uh, Smilodon was scarce. All big carnivores are scarce. So if you could go back to the Pleistocene, you would see plenty of, uh, of mammoths, plenty of uh, buffalo, bison, horses, but you would be lucky to see a saber tooth. That's what happens to me when I go to Africa to look for the big cats. I see zebra, 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 and I'm happy to see them. I love zebra. But I say, okay, where is the cat? So there's a logic for that. Because every animal needs to be far outweighed by its food source. So you need to have a lot of trees and a lot of uh, grass to support a lot of herbivores, and those herbivores support the carnivores. But there are fossil sites in the world where this proportion seems to be reversed. So one of those places is Rancho La Brea in California, the kingdom of Smilodon. And in that fossil site, over 90% of the fossils that you find correspond to predators. So that's absolutely unheard of among uh, fossil sites. In a normal fossil site, you would find hundreds and hundreds of fossils of herbivores. But these places were acting like carnivore traps. So the reason why we find their fossils there is because there was carrion, and somehow the carnivores were attracted to that carrion, and they found their death there. In the case of uh, Rancho La Brea, it was the sticky asphalt that trapped both prey and predators. So more and more saber tooths came and they got trapped. Lucky for us, not for them. So now we have plenty of fossils of a smilodon and we can reconstruct it. And we can reconstruct its world and uh, its ecosystem. And uh, now I want to, to take as an excuse to show you how I proceed you know, something, the more artistic side of my work. Uh, this is the, the process how I built uh, a scene showing Smilodon uh, getting ready to eat uh, its prey, a taper in this case, in Rancho La Brea. While in the background you sort of can imagine a, a group of wolves 
chasing some bison, trying to snatch a young animal. So this, this uh, scene was created to illustrate a scientific paper where uh, the, the results of which suggest that the Smilodon uh, was keen on hunting prey that lived in the forest, in the woods. So in this uh, scene, I had to bring together all that information showing the wolves hunting plains living animals, like the bison, and uh, Smilodon getting ready to eat a tapir that lives in the woods. So I accumulate a lot of uh, quick uh, sketches of the, the um, characters in the story, the running wolves, the running bison, then different attitudes for uh, the uh, saber-toothed cat ready to eat its prey. Then I was uh, still wondering if I would uh, draw the taper being killed, trying to regain its feet or just laying dead. So I use uh, pictures of, of uh, sleeping taper for reference. <laughs> this one was actually sleeping the final sleep. So uh, <laughs> I sent different versions of these uh, sketches to, to the scientists until we uh, agreed on a final composition, which essentially was this one. But when I was already painting the final color version, we found that it would be more realistic to have another saber tooth uh, joining uh, the feast. So we added this element, and that's, uh, that's a process that took me maybe uh, a month or two. But of course, it is uh, the aggregation of a very much longer experience of, of many years. So, for decades, Rancho La Brea was the undisputed uh, best fossil site in the world uh, for learning about saber-toothed cats. But then, uh, more recently, another fossil site was found in Spain. And uh, for years, I had been dreaming of coming to the States, of coming to Rancho La Brea uh, to see that you know, mythical uh, fossil site and see the fossils. And I did that uh, in 1991. But that same year, a discovery was made like uh, 15 miles from my home back in Madrid. <laughs> so, uh, OK, thank you. <laughs> and uh, that was a much older fossil site, fossil site than uh, Rancho La Brea. Rancho La Brea is uh, like uh, 20,000 years old, 10,000, 40, so it accumulated for several tens of thousands of years at the end of the Pleistocene. But Batallones, which was discovered in the Madrid province where I live, is uh, 9, 10 million years old. So again, this is a carnivore trap, but one of a different kind. Here we don't have sticky asphalt. Here we had cavities that uh, attracted herbivores because there was some water in the bottom. And those herbivores could never get out because of the shape of the cavities. So it was apparently easy to jump in, but there you died. And the carnivores would come to scavenge on those herbivores. And one after another entered confident they would be able to jump out, but they never could. So in Batallones, we find you see here the hands of a paleontologist about to extract the complete skull of, a, of an early saber-toothed cat. So the good thing is that this fossil site doesn't com compete with Rancho La Brea. It complements it. It's like alpha and omega. Here we have the early stages of the evolution of saber tooth. And in Rancho La Brea, we have the end of that long road. So these Ceratus from Batallones were much more primitive. They weren't nearly as refined in their saber tooth adaptations as those from Rancho La Brea. So we have two species. You see the big one on the background is about the size of a modern lion or tiger. It is called Machairodus. And the smaller one, about the size of a leopard, was called, is called Promegantherion. And that 
the smaller one would be the grand grand grandfather of Smilodon, so to speak. So with so many bones, so many skeletons of these saber tooths as we find in Batallones, we can get an accurate uh, idea of their body proportions and anatomy. So Permeganterion had the proportions and the anatomy of an agile climber. And that was just as well, because on firm ground, its uh, bigger cousin was king. So if those two animals had to live together and share the ecosystem of Batallones, it was essential that the smaller one could take to the trees to avoid the attentions of its uh, bigger cousin. Today in Africa, uh, whenever I see leopards, there is always a tree not very far away. Because the moment a lion looms on the horizon, the leopard goes up. That's what uh, its life depends on. Because carnivores are so competitive. They don't have any pity of their competitors. So they kill another carnivore and leave it to rot. They are not going to eat it. It's just eliminating the competition. So, uh, with the incredible fossil record of uh, Batallones Tabertudes, we have been able to do something more than just drawing and painting reconstructions. I have been able to play with uh, my 3D uh, software and work with animators to recreate the locomotion of these uh, two species. So we have every bone of the skeleton of Fromigantarion. It allows us to, to see that its proportions were not very different from those of a leopard, but of course with a shorter uh, tail, somewhat longer neck, but uh, moving around in a very feline-like way. And of course, uh, climbing very efficiently to the trees of the Miocene. So being able to do this kind of animations has two advantages. We can sort of uh, confirm or check our hypothesis about the locomotion, and we can make it available, uh, we can make our hypothesis available to a much wider audience. So here is Macarodus, and uh, you may think they look the same, and uh, you would not be wrong. Because back in, in those days, in the Miocene, the different branches of the, of the saber-toothed cat subfamily had barely separated. So the main difference between these two animals was size, which on the other hand is what happens with modern lions and leopards, or tigers and leopards. Fortunately for us, leopards have spots and tigers have stripes. Because otherwise, if they, if, they, if they had the same color, we would be in trouble to tell one apart from the other, because they are very close relatives. In fact, lions, leopards, tigers, they belong in the same genus. They are all panthera. So if we talk about Smilodon, we are talking again about a genus which had several species. So, Probably if we found Smilodon populator from South America or Smilodon fatalis from North America, we could never confuse them because probably one of them had stripes and the other had spots. We don't know. So uh, let's continue. Hmm. Now another of my childhood questions but how did they kill their prey? And looking at that beautiful illustration by Salinger, what I saw was an illustration of the classic theory of the stabbing uh, killing uh, method. What does that mean? That the, the upper canines of Smilodon would work like 
a knife wielded by a human hand and arm. So if I have a, a knife in my, in my hand, my whole arm is providing the necessary impetus for the hit. And if the same had to happen with, with, the, with the teeth of a smilodon, then you would need the whole neck of the animal to work like the hand that wields the, the, the knife. And another thing that would happen is that the mandible is just something that you need to get out of the way. Because, because if I have a, a, a knife, but I have a mandible, then when I'm trying to hit, I, I just cannot penetrate. So this theory was popular for a time, but then uh, paleontologists noted an, a fatal flaw in it, which is that the teeth of saber tooth are different from those of, uh, of modern big cats, not only by being very long, but also by being very flat, which is what allows them to penetrate like an, a knife. Because the, 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 the canines of a lion are conical. So they don't really cut through flesh. They press against the, the throat of prey. And being flat, these canines are fragile. So if you want to, to do this kind of thing with them, sorry, that's not steel. That's just a, a, a more fragile tissue. So uh, paleontologists had to go back to the drawing table and get a new hypothesis from scratch. And for that, they needed to compare the differences between the skulls of the saber tooth and the modern cats in even more detail. So, okay, the, the canines are much longer, but there are other differences. And uh, those differences include the ear region, where there is a, a, a process for muscle insertion, and that process receives muscles coming from the neck. And uh, they are far more developed in the saber tooth. So, okay, the neck was providing the strength for the bite, but not in the way that the stabbing theory uh, proposes, but by acting relative to the first uh, cervical vertebra, the atlas. So what is really happening is that the whole head is being is going to sink the canines into the flesh of prey. And when that initial sinking has taken place, the muscles of the mandible can close uh, the mouth, close the jaw, in a more classical uh, way like that that modern uh, cats do. So again, I think this is going to be more clear uh, if we explain it with a video. So this video, uh, it's a combination of my, uh, f my clips from my observations of the wild cats of, of Africa, which I have taken as a, a starting point for my comparisons with the hypothetical uh, bite of the saber tooth. and dramatic. Those cramped around the antelope's muscle. The process would have I'm going to touch phone. I'm going to 
antelope too in canines. With an antelope. Same things could be the wrong. They don't even puncture this. of the larger saber tooth cat. Probably help them to prevent. Okay. So what we are seeing is the uh, the, the evolution of the uh, saber tooth uh, adaptation as uh, continues. It's something that is uh, happening, and that probably did never achieve or attain perfection. Because perfection is, is not something that biological organisms ever achieve. It's just good enough uh, to survive another day or to defeat a competitor. So uh, Macariodosaur or Promegantherion did the best they could, but they got their, especially Macariodos got their its canines broken very often. But still, it was better than all the other predators around in the, in, in the late Miocene. So it became the most successful uh, form of a uh, big predator on land. But of course, animals like Megantherium that we see here, that lived in, in the Pliocene millions of years later, were far more sophisticated. And uh, probably they were too sophisticated for their own good. But that, that's uh, the final part of, of the presentation, so I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So here we see Macariodus uh, using his deadly weapons to, to kill a, a primitive horse in, in the Batallones area. And uh, it not only used its canines, it used its whole neck to uh, get uh, in position and to power the bite. And how this happens, we discovered recently, and we have just published a scientific paper on this. And uh, this is a little bit uh, technical, but still I want to share it with you, like the overall conclusion of this uh, scientific paper, which is essentially that uh, Macariodus, as we knew, wasn't perfect. It was only good enough in its adaptations. to 
roof and it's made like a volcano, larger than those of extant big It has puzzled scientists for decades. One key to understanding how saber tooth skill puzzles contribute. Derived saber tooths from the brain, like smilebone or homotherium, had longer and more muscular legs than normal cats. Their neck muscles to help drive their upper canines into the flesh of prey. Every saber tooth has been made at the Miocene site of Cerro de los Batallones in Madrid now have a rich sample of neck vertebrae of the early Macarolontine Macarolontine Bones is not enough. It helps us to understand how the musculature of the neck would work in the extinct The first cervical vertebra of Macarolus resembles that of normal cats. Different several two species. Vertebrae, second. With prominent muscle insertions, like those of the later saber tooth. The quality of the atlas is very important for the same. Aerodus already had very flat. So one would expect a more special mixture of ancestral and evolution. Thus seems that the primitive bite was less aerodus than in later relatives, but it was effective enough to make it an enormously successful All right, so... This has been like, a, like an overview, extensive, of uh, some of the many uh, techniques, the many approaches that uh, one needs to combine to bring together from the, the African savanna to the laboratory to the 3D uh, software in order to try to get a, a more believable image of the saber tooths. So uh, now I am in the process of preparing uh, a book that uh, is still in the, in the works but it's my attempt to integrate uh, much of this uh, work, uh, not only to show the servitudes, but their whole world, especially in Africa, where for uh, many uh, thousands, even millions of years, servitudes even coexisted with modern cats. So uh, I show you just a few of the reconstructions that I am preparing for uh, this book, as seen in the latest Miocene of uh, Southern uh, Africa, with a saber tooth and a bear. Yes, there were bears in Africa at the time. A family group of uh, saber tooth homotherium in the Pliocene or Pleistocene of uh, East Africa. My favorite saber tooth, Megantherion, uh, chasing a herd of impala which is an interesting site of uh, many African fossil sites from the Pliocene and Pleistocene, that you see strange extinct animals side by side with other animals that are perfectly familiar to us today, like the impala, which is everywhere in Africa. There's a, a saber tooth with a very long name, <laughs> Locotun gylurus. Uh, it's endemic to Africa, and it was uh, described a few years ago. And, of course, I cannot separate, uh, as part of this integration, 
the drawing, painting, and reconstructing of the saber tooths with the study of their modern relatives. So I need to go back time and again to see, to draw, to observe the modern cats in the wild. It's the only way to really have uh, the, the, the toolkit that will allow us to reconstruct the saber tooths. And finally, when I talk about saber tooths and hominins, saber tooths and our own kind, I am beginning to talk about their extinction. This uh, scene, this painting that I made of an early hominin, looking with fascination, curiosity, at a melanistic saber tooth that is about to eat its uh, antelope prey, was uh, used uh, in a recent paper about the impact of early hominins on their ecosystems and on the carnivorans in particular. And now it's becoming evident that our, our ancestors, our early relatives, were having a stronger impact on the carnivores around than we used to think, and they had it earlier than we used to think. So for most of our evolutionary history, we fit very well with the classic concept of the prey. Uh, our uh, Australopithecine ancestors were mostly vegetarian, uh, especially some species, and uh, their reaction when seeing a saber tooth was like the leopard who sees a lion, climb up the nearest tree. But then something happened and our ancestors become uh, larger, meaner, and better organized. And they develop a taste for meat. So that allowed them, according to some uh, anthropologists, to get a shorter gut and a bigger brain. And uh, they got used to uh, rob the big cats of their prey, especially solitary saber tooth. Uh, who were no contest to a well-organized band of uh, Homo ergaster warriors. So we cornered the saber tooth, but we shouldn't feel completely guilty for their extinction. Because the extinction of the saber tooth probably was largely a consequence of their own success. Because they were so specialized they were so efficient in killing a big prey in one particular manner that, like all the specialists, they become much less flexible in the face of environmental crisis. Now we are in the middle of a big environmental crisis. We have the global warming, and uh, we are very concerned, and rightly so. But in the past, this happened many times so what we call the Ice Ages were not just a cold period where we would need uh, uh, very uh, warm clothes. It was a time of violent and almost unpredictable change. So that the distribution of resources became much more unpredictable. And in, in that time, animals like the saber tooth were finding it tougher and tougher to survive. And then our, our classic view is like, oh, poor things, the saber tooths. They were slow, they were clumsy, they could only kill those behemoths, the, 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 the mastodons or whatever. Fortunately, evolution created the modern cats that can run very fast. They are agile and, and they can uh, outrun uh, very quick prey, like the cheetah. But how wrong would we be? Because the cheetah, who is the uh, absolute opposite to saber tooths, almost got extinct at the same time as the saber tooths did. So by the end of the Pleistocene, there was probably something like half a dozen cheetahs left just waiting for extinction to happen. A consequence of that, of that huge bottleneck, that genetic bottleneck, all living cheetahs are like close cousins. They almost lack any genetic uh, variability. So if we had a very bad uh, illness, it could wipe them off the earth. But still they managed to come back. 
The only difference with the saber tooth is they couldn't. But uh, it happened about at the same time as the Smilodon got extinct, like at the end of the Pleistocene. Maybe 10,000 years ago, something like that. So difficult times uh, are good for the generalist, for the opportunist, and they are bad for uh, the specialist. So uh, for people like me, <laughs> who have become a specialist in, in, in this remote uh, field of expertise I've been talking to you about, I should have reasons for concern. But I think I'm not the only one in this hall. So finally, I have come a bit closer to answering uh, several of the questions that this painting posed for me as a child all those uh, years ago, half a century ago. Uh, in the meantime, much many, uh, many more questions have, have uh, you know, uh, arisen for me. But the first question, is this uh, accurate? Was this painting uh, a valid representation of the saber tooth killing its prey? Well, as I told you, this is a depiction of the stabbing uh, theory. So in that sense, it's probably outdated. But for me, this image remains valid in two ways. It's a good representation of the broad anatomy of these animals from the Ice Age. It's a good representation of the science of its time, the first half of the 20th century. And it is good enough on artistic uh, grounds to remain a masterpiece. So I think that's all that we as paleo artists can strive for. Let's hope that a few decades uh, from, uh, from now, the worst that can be said of our work is that it's dated. Well, science is getting dated all the time. So we must be humble and know that it is going to happen for certain. But in the meantime, it's also important that we have fun. So I hope uh, you had some fun uh, with this uh, story. So thank you very much for your attention. So I don't know if I still have time for a few questions. Yeah, so please don't be shy. Any curiosity, yeah? So I, I have two questions. The, the first, I've done this for a really long time. Yeah. I'm really good at this. Second, the follow up question. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that uh, in the field of um, mammalian reconstruction, uh, which is my specialty to reconstruct fossil mammals, uh, the advances had been very technical. So probably there has been nothing incredibly spectacular. Uh, probably most of the uh, uh, big changes for the public are more related to the interpretation of uh, our own evolution as, as uh, hominins than carnivores. So uh, the most drastic changes that I have seen since I began in this career have, uh, are related to the dinosaurs. So uh, when I started, and uh, I think, do you still uh, hear me? I to this, but now I can answer your question. Uh, I did quite a few dinosaur reconstructions. Back then, they were all... Oh, and cumbersome. <laughs> The small carnivore dinosaurs we know. running around all, all the place, 
And uh, we even know means of reconstruction that is always left for especially preserved have structures related types and bands of color along the feather that's really really So what I'm hoping happen uh, find some uh, frog are getting closer because we found island. Early see the other. I would say. Along any, okay, okay, along any of these uh, lineages that we have been seeing that converge in this in this uh, evolution, the early stages always have more moderate uh, crown height, but as they develop their upper, upper canines, we see all the other. Um, adaptations in the skull, in the, in the neck, taking place. So uh, that's what defines the saber tooth, that even with uh, only marginally longer canines than a modern cat, it's already biting in a different way. So it's powering its bite with, uh, with the upper muscles of the neck, and it is uh, trying to cut rather than press. So it's not, not going to... to cut the, the, the air supply, but it's going to cut the, the blood supply, which leads to a quicker, faster death. And I think you, you ask about DNA. Uh, yes, the early uh, studies of DNA in, in uh, saber-toothed cats were with, uh, done with samples taken from Smilodon, and that was in the late 90s, and the surprising result was that uh, this animal, Smilodon, was part of the Panthera rad radiation. So it suggested that it was so closely related to, to uh, lions, tigers, that it was more closely related to them than to a house cat. And I was like scratching my head, back then I had hair even here, and I thought, there's something wrong here because the anatomy and the fossil record 
are telling a very different story. So back then I was commissioned by National Geographic to illustrate an article about uh, cat evolution and I was asked to draw a, a phylogeny like those I have shown you with a smilodon nested among the panthera cats. And I, I said I wouldn't do it. I need to wait for more evidence. This paper may be published in Nature or whatever, but it's not enough. So uh, eventually it was found that the DNA was contaminated. So uh, it took many years to get better, more refined techniques to extract and amplify the, 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 the genetic material. And uh, the more recent results are showing that saber tooths are more related to each other, like Smilodon are homotherium, they are closely related and more close to each other than to any modern cat. So now uh, the better techniques are showing a coincidence with the story told by the fossils, which makes me much, much happier. More questions? Yeah. Yeah, uh, for my 2D art, I work only with Photoshop. And actually, I'm using like an old version, which is the CS3 or something like that, from, from uh, you know, almost from the time of the saber tooths. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it suits my needs. Because essentially, you know, at the beginning of when I uh, went digital, I was using a lot of, uh, of um, you know, photographic textures. So I was borrowing from uh, photographs and trying to integrate. And that became a nightmare because really the eye can tell. Uh, so I spent more time trying to, to, to bring together the, the two parts of the work than actually doing it. So now what I'm doing is I'm painting in Photoshop using the same technique as, as when I painted in oils. So I'm using the, the, the virtual uh, brush brushes as if they were real brushes. So I don't need much uh, like um, sophistication for that. So the good old Photoshop works for me. And then for 3D, I use the good old uh, 3D Studio Max for modeling and for creating uh, models that I can pass on to the animators who uh, animated within the same uh, software. Yeah? Yes, of course. Yeah, I think that for the longer uh, saber-toothed cats, and in particular for a smilodon, I think it is very clear that the canines were exposed. Even though there are, are a lot of arguments out there, but anatomically, uh, I see no way that they could be uh, uh, covered. But for the other species, and that means most of them, uh, I think that there is a range of possibilities. So essentially, uh, I have been conservative uh, while I uh, um, advance with more and more comparisons and more and more uh, research trying to establish uh, the case for each larger group. So I'm working on it, and my view now is that probably uh, at least some of the species with medium-sized sabers, uh, maybe we wouldn't see the sabers. But uh, exactly how uh, that was possible is, uh, is something that uh, I will be showing uh, you know, over the next uh, months and years. Let's do one more, Mauricio. There's one up here. Yeah.
Oh, sorry, I, I, I do understand the, the question well. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit like, uh, like saying that uh, uh, big cats that live in plains have plain color, like the lion. But then, sorry, uh, the, the mountain lion, the, the cougar, uh, lives in forests or in open areas, and it has plain color too. So the exceptions are as important as the, as the rule. And with the tail, the same happens. Uh, you have short-tailed uh, cats, like the lynxes, the bobcats, the, the, um, the caracal in Africa, which can be very acrobatic. And they chase, uh, for instance, the, the Iberian lynx chases its rabbit prey, and the rabbits jump in every other direction, and the lynx follows, and it manages to keep its balance very well. So uh, one first impression is that if for any phylogenetic reasons one lineage lost much of its tail, uh, and it is managing to do well, then it's, uh, it's going to survive with what it's got. But if another cat has a very long tail, then it will use it to improve. But one thing is to, to, to be closer to perfection, and another thing is what allows you to survive. So I think that probably snow leopards and cheetahs and leopards benefit from their long uh, tails. But uh, you can... Rem uh, I'm familiar with one story from uh, the Maasai Mara in Kenya, where one famous female leopard that was very, uh, you know, like relaxed in front of vehicles, so she became the, the star of several documentary films. Uh, at some point of her adult life, when she was already the mother of several calves, very successful, she lost most of her tail. And you could think, okay, she's doomed. Not at all. She did so well. She lived to, to a respectable uh, old life, old, old age, and managed to raise many more calves, and she was killing an impala a day. So it's like, uh, you know, sometimes we see animals as machines, like, uh, like an airplane, and if an airplane has a, a problem with one wing, it's going to, to, to fall down. But animals have room. They have room for imperfection. So uh, I'm sure that a, a long tail is, is, uh, is advantageous, but the saber tooths did perfectly well without it. And I suspect they lost it partly as a as, as something related to their heavy, front heavy anatomies. Like they needed big, powerful necks, big, powerful uh, uh, forelimbs to hold their prey. So it's like the, the, the back part, well, okay, became like less relevant <laughs> in a way. So thank you again, Mauricio. Yeah.